diffraction happens when waves move from one medium to another medium. We've already considered this with travelling waves. We said that when a wave moved from one medium to another medium, some things changed. The wavelength changed and the speed changed. We said the frequency of the wave remained the same. The frequency is set by the source which is generating that wave and that's not changing so it doesn't make sense for the frequency to change. Now if we're considering waves in more than one dimension, something else can also change as well. The direction that the wave is going can also change. Now as we'll see for light, when we're considering it travelling through a medium, there's another useful thing to think about as well, which is the refractive index of the medium. So the refractive index of the medium is found by dividing the speed of light in a vacuum by the speed of light in that medium. So for a vacuum, the refractive index is 1 because it's just the speed of light divided by the speed of light. For air, the refractive index is also very, very close to 1 because light travels at almost the speed of light in air. For water, the refractive index is around about 1.33. Different glasses have different refractive indices, but a typical value is around about 1.5. Diamond actually has a really high refractive index of about 2.42 and this is what makes diamonds really, really sparkly. So as you've seen, when light goes from one medium to another medium, the frequency of the light doesn't change. However, lots of things do change. The light bends and so the angle changes. It can speed up or slow down slow down if it's going into a more optically dense medium and so the speed changes and because of our wave equation that the speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, if the speed is changing and the frequency is staying the same then we know that the wavelength has to change as well. So we have a very useful quantitative equation that describes the relationship between all these properties. It's called Snell's Law and can be written as N1 on N2, so that's referring to the refractive indices, is equal to sine theta 2 on sine theta 1. Now theta 1 and theta 2 here refer to the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. And so the angle of incidence is theta 1 and it is measured as the angle between the normal to the surface and the light ray. The angle of refraction is theta 2 and it is equal to the angle between the normal to the surface and the direction the ray travels once it's entered the new medium. And so continuing with Snell's law, n1 on n2 is equal to sine theta 2 on sine theta 1 is equal to lambda 2 on lambda 1 where lambda here stands for the wavelength and that is equal to v2 on v1 where V stands for the velocity in this case. So let's have a look now at how we can use Snell's law to solve a problem. So the problem is light passes from air with a refractive index of 1.00 to water with a refractive index of 1.33. If the angle of incidence in air is 30 degrees and the wavelength of light in air is lambda is equal to 545 nanometers, Calculate A, the angle of refraction, B, the wavelength of the light in water, and C, the speed of light in the water. Now the best thing to start doing in a question such as this is sketching a diagram so that we can clearly see what's going on. So we've got a boundary here. Up here we've got air. Down here we've got water. Let's sketch in our normal and now draw our light coming in. We've got an angle of 30 degrees and some other angle. So this angle here is 30 degrees, the angle of incidence, and this is the angle of refraction here. Now we're going to need to use Snell's law in order to solve this. So we'll need to make use of the refractive index of air being 1.00 and the refractive index of water is 1.33. And Snell's law tells us that N1 on N2, so Na on Nw in this case, is equal to sine theta W, sine theta 2, over sine theta A. 
And so we can now substitute in. What we're trying to find out is this angle in water, the theta water. So let's just rearrange it before we substitute in. So we've got sine theta w is equal to Na on Nw times sine theta A. And now we can substitute in. Na is 1.00, Nw is 1.33, and sine theta, that's times sine 30. And so solving this one on the calculator, we can get 0 0.376. And then we just have to do the inverse sine on our calculator. So solving that on our calculator gives us theta w is equal to 22 degrees. And so we've now worked out the angle of refraction. Now next we're asked to calculate the wavelength of the light in the water. So we need to find lambda in water. From Snell's law we have that lambda on, in water over lambda on air is equal to n in n in air over n in water and so lambda in water is equal to n air over n water times lambda air and so this is equal to 1 over 1.33 times 545 nanometers and solving this one on the calculator we end up with 410 nanometers and we've given this one to two significant figures sorry to three significant figures now part C, we're asked to find the speed of light in water. And so just again using the part of Snell's law, the speed in water over the speed in air is equal to the refractive index in air over the refractive index in water. And so we have that our speed in water is equal to Na over Nw times Va, which is equal to 1 over 1 1.33 times the speed in air. Now the speed of light in air is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum approximately, which is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so this is equal to 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So still very fast, but not as fast as in air. And this is to three significant figures. Now that we've had a look at an example of using Snell's law, let's go and see the proof of Snell's law. Okay, so what we've got here from PhysClips is a little animation showing light traveling from one medium here, medium one, to medium two. And what you can see is the wave fronts. So the distance between the wave fronts is equal to the wave length. And what this little animation here is showing is how the electric field's changing. You don't need to worry about that for now. In the later course, 9130, we'll have a look at exactly what that means. Okay, but for now, it's going from medium 1 to medium 2. You can see in medium 1, the wavelength is bigger and it's traveling more quickly. And then in medium 2, the wavelength is shorter and it's traveling more slowly. And you can also see that the ray which is drawn here, the ray is always drawn at right angles to the wave fronts, bends. So the angle with the normal is larger in the first medium than the second medium. Okay, so what we're going to do now is remember this image and go and derive Snell's law. Okay, so now I've taken a screenshot of what we were just looking at and now we can analyze it to show Snell's law. Now the distance between two wave fronts when we go along a line which is perpendicular to them is just the wavelength. So this length here is equal to lambda 2 and this line here is at 90 degrees to the wave front. So this length here is equal to lambda 1, the wavelength in medium 1. Now what we're going to need to do is look at the angles. We said that the angle between the ray here and the wave front here was equal to 90 degrees. So that angle in there is 90 degrees. The angle between the normal and the medium is also 90 degrees. So that tells us that this angle in here must be theta 1 because theta 1 plus this angle equals 90 and this angle plus theta 1 equals 90. So that's theta 1. 
Okay, now this angle in here is equal to theta 2, which means that this angle here is equal to 90 minus theta 2. The wave front and the ray are at right angles to each other. So that tells us this, this angle down here is equal to theta 2. So now what we can do is some simple trigonometry because these are all right angle triangles. So looking at this green triangle, we've got sine theta 1 is equal to opposite, which is lambda 1, over the hypotenuse. Now this is the hypotenuse in this case. Let's call it D. So that's over D. Now for the second triangle, we've got sine theta 2 is equal to opposite, which in this case is equal to lambda 2 over D. So we can rearrange these two equations for D. So we've got D is equal to lambda 1 over sine theta 1. And here we've got D is equal to lambda 2 over sine theta 2. Okay, so how Snell's law is often written is sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. So if we move this over here, is equal to lambda 1 over lambda 2. Okay, now often in Snell's law, we also relate in the refractive indices and the speeds. So let's put the speed in now. Now the wavelength, that's how far the light travels in one period, which is the inverse of a frequency. So that is equal to V1 on F. And lambda 2 is V2 on F. These frequencies are the same because that's set by the source which creates the waves and so does not change. So we can see that is equal to V1 on V2. Now we can also relate this to refractive indices because we said that the refractive index in the medium is equal to the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the velocity in that medium. So that tells us that the velocity in the medium is equal to the speed of light over the refractive index. So we can substitute this in here, and then we've got c over n1, c over n2. The speed of light in the vacuum is the same in both cases, so this is equal to n2 on n1. So there you have it, we've derived all of Snell's law. These are all of the relationships that you're likely to come across involving Snell's law.